Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween in Middle School for Life. Well, we just left the uh, observation vlog. We're still outside. Uh, it is actually zero hours um, into the 30th day of November. Zero hours and zero minutes. We're at the zero hour, the zero point. Uh, into the 30, 30th day of uh, November 2021. Time and date stamp. Always important, important for various different... Uh, uh, scientific notation in terms of you're writing your journal, you're writing a log, and you need your time and date stamp. Uh, so we've done that. We were talking about how the pirates, in terms of ADOS and the issue of the American descendants, uh, the American descendants of slavery. I'm trying to help you guys out. If, Yvette, if you ever see this, I'm trying to help you guys out. You're never going to get what you want from the government. I said, I'm, an, I'm anti establishment You have to walk away from the government. All the uncles I know, the aunties who were, they were sharecroppers. They came over as child, they came over to the United States, to Canada as child laborers. Pulled themselves up because they understood they could not rely on the government. Early Christianity is anti establishment. It's about moving away from the government, moving away from status in society. This is why it's anti standard because it's not about creating status for yourself. It's about getting rid of status. And this is why we get, get into the Gnostic stuff, because the early Christian understanding is the only Gnostic part, is the only Gnostic section that has the understanding that you have a direct connection with God. All the others, there are intermediaries. There, there are different levels. And this is what creates the levels of society. Your levels of society are based on the interaction between God and man. The Gnostic understanding is there's God, there is God or a God. There is chaos of positive and negative, and then there's the whole system below it. And this is what the Illuminati struggle to get as much as they can to, to separate themselves from the fundamental system and get into the higher rankings so they have a better position, so-called within within their heaven. Some have developed in terms of their understanding that there's no way to get to heaven. It's too, too difficult because you're not, you can never be selfless enough in order to get to heaven. Uh, this is well within the Hindu understanding of things uh, in terms of the dharmic, the, the dharmic sense, the dharmic life. Uh, and so they said, well, it's easier to go to hell than it is to go to heaven. And so they chose to work on the left-hand path. They, that's what their choice. And again, they work off the... Uh, they uh, will work off the 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 negative path. You have positive chaos and you have negative. You have positive energy and negative energy. Well, the left hand path are the dark side. They're the left. They're they're the dark part of the yin and yang. If you understand, if you've seen ever seen the symbol, it's a round thing and you've got two little squiggly things in there. One is white, one is black. That's the yin, yin and yang. Well, that's what this talks about. It talks about this sort of this ether out there, black and white. That is kind of separated, and that as they interact, interact in the middle, this is where life is created. Create life in all order comes out of chaos. That uh, you have this in actually mathematics with the chaos theory now, and a large chunk of this comes in simply because uh, the mathematics itself, the calcul calculus, uh, is not a mathematics of, of what we call determinism. Uh, in other words, you can't determine things with calculus. You can't prove it. Uh, only thing you can do with calculus is do an approximation because the mathematics of calculus is 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 fundamentally that it's a mathematics of approximation. I went into the sort of the structures of uh, Euclidean space and, uh, and getting into time. Well, how do you have time as a dimension? Well, you don't. The time the time as a dimension is 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 essentially an issue of calculus. It's it's it's, it's a, an asymptotic understanding. That you don't, you never get to the, to the position or the axis of time. You only approximate it, and you only approximate it within the Euclidean, Euclidean or flat space geometry. 
And this is where, where a large chunk of the problem is that there's there's evidence out there for flat for for a a uh, old evidence, historical evidence, uh, archaeological evidence for a three dimensional Earth rather than a flat Earth. Uh, there's the geometry sort of for it, but the geometry is all within flat spaces. And so, in other words, we can only get a very minute understanding of the, the dimensions beyond time, beyond space, getting into time. So, we, because we describe everything within flat space, so even the third dimension can never be fully understood in terms of its our our outer understanding of it in terms of beyond the Earth, uh, because we can never get close enough because our understanding not all most of the calculus and is based on Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry is only two dimensions. And you project the two dimensions into the third. So you're not actually going into the third dimension when you're doing a calculation. You're staying within the Euclidean space of two dimensions and projecting into the third. And in all many cases in your drawings, you project, this is how you do the you how do you create three dimensions in a two-dimensional space when you're doing cartoons or even a, a drawing? You create this illusion. The way you draw the lines, the way you do your shadows, that will give the illusion of three dimensions. So it's there in, it's there in our TV. It's there in a lot of different where, – where you have the projection of the third dimension into the two dimensions. So you see in terms of your illusion, in terms of what your eye perceives, you see the three dimensions, but the d- three dimensions aren't fundamentally there. It's only the two dimensions that you're seeing. You know, even with the TV screen here, or whatever screen you're watching this on. Again, very complex, heavy, heavy mathematics uh, to do this. But the thing is, is that people who are involved in this thing, in order to understand their magic, in order to understand how power works, the magical power works, uh, we'll all have to understand some form of mathematics. That's why it gets very complex. This is why you have a lot of tomes. You have a lot of, you have volumes of. Dictionaries, books, uh, diaries, manuscripts, uh, all describing various different things. The more you have an understanding of the various types of Gnosticism that are out there, the types of called the pagan world, where you have that separation between God and man by chaos, there's a large chunk of it that, that is, there's Hinduism, there is Judaism. Judaism is not the Old Testament. Judaism is a creation that was around at the, at the time of the Old Testament, but actually had a believing that God was separated from man. Again, because so now it falls outside of, uh, of the, the, the Christ, early Christian sphere, and so does Protestantism, Roman Catholicism. Most of what you see when you think of Christianity today, the Western Christian, which is Western, Western Christianity, it's white Christianity. There is an Eastern, and there's a dark. There, there's an Eastern Christianity that is not white. The white Christianity is pagan. It has a separation between God and man. That's why you have the Pope. And the thing is, so what happens is that to understand this further, to see how the papacy came out and where it came out from, there's a huge history of this, is you have to learn and understand the term of of the Sephardic Jew and the Hasidic Jew. Go into a history of Judaism, and the way I did, there's a lot, again, it took me, I've been doing this now for more than 10 years. And again, you go to, you have a lot of these lectures online. They have these rabbinical conferences. Go to, go, 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 go through these rabbinical conferences online. And sit down, take your notes, and see what they're talking about. You'll eventually see Kabbalism, what they call Kabbalism. Everyone, once in a while, a rabbi will talk about these different things. And you'll have different views from different rabbis. And they'll give you a history and a play, people people to go and research. Because, again, these aren't in textbooks. You have to go find the names, find what they've written, if anyone has actually put the stuff out. Sometimes you get these archives just dumped online, and no one, know, no one knows what's in the ar- archive. It's never been indexed. So you have to go through randomly to sort of pick through things and see what you find. There. Sometimes you get great stuff, and sometimes you don't. The unfortunate stuff at the time, the, old, uh, the unfortunate is when you get a great amount of stuff, you, find, you, you hit gold, you're not sleeping. You're not going to be sleeping for another couple of days at least. You know, uh, there are times when I've hit a good gold vein and it left me, from, left me from one to another to another. 
I, I wasn't sleeping properly for months at a time. I had lost track of entire months because you get to the desk, you get to your research desk as soon as you wake up because you get an idea, you wake up, ah, I know where to find this. <laughs> you know, you go down, you look for this, or ah, ah, you wake up with an idea, ah, I know where to look. You try it out, you say, oh, let me just check it out five minutes. Let me see if I can find some. You find it, you hit the gold, you hit the gold and bang. You're not going to bed for another another 15 hours because it's obsessive. It, it's it, it's is it it's a puzzle, but the puzzles aren't the pieces of the puzzle aren't given to you. You have to find them. They're scattered all over the place. When you and that's a scavenger hunt. When you hit the good vein of gold, where all these different parts are, where all this information is, you know you have to go through it. You have to go through it and spend as much time as you can because that archive is going to disappear. And I've seen this happen. I've seen archives. Oh, great stuff. And within two, three months, it's gone. Typically, the archive, your typical archive will last maybe two, three weeks, and then it's gone. And, these are, these, and a lot of times, they really, people realize there's stuff in there that uh, shouldn't be in there. There's stuff that was supposed to be hidden, supposed to be secret, and it spills up because no one actually knew that it was there. It's, it, this is, <laughs> you can hide things intentionally, but this, this, this is kind of, you know, this is the kid thing. Uh, but I think most of us can remember back to our Halloweens. And we used to watch our, the, the kids have Halloween today. And the kids will understand, okay, you know, if I leave my Halloween stash out there, there are going to be people taking brothers, sisters, so on and so forth. They're going to take your candy. So what do you do? You hide your candy. What happens? After a month or so, you forget where the candy is. Go back and next year, ah, clean the closet. Oh, <laughs> I don't remember this. The old, this is where you had all my candy because you forgot about it. And this is what happens: things are things get lost within history. Things that were supposed to be secret, they get they get hidden, put away someplace. Uh, this is <laughs> this is again for for guys and those who are comic book and, and uh, hockey card collectors. You have these collector collections. You collect them as a kid. Your parents, the parents, particularly the mothers who clean the house. Don't understand the value of these things. Don't worry, they're value, they're valuable. And you put them away, and when you're gone, you've grown up and say, oh, he doesn't need the stuff anymore. She either gives it to a garage sale or throws it out. Well, there goes close to a quarter, you know, over a million dollars worth of baseball cards or a million dollars worth of collectibles because they, they, they appreciate in value. So what happens, you, this is, the collector goes to these, you know, garage sales, these, these things, and picks these things up that someone has no idea how one how much value they have to them, and they'll buy them for a dollar or whatever, whatever the whatever the mother's selling it for. Yeah, this is my old this is my son's old old stuff. Here, you know, five bucks is good enough. And she's giving away millions of dollars worth of uh, uh, baseball cards. <laughs> That's what it is. But any collectible will do. And this is what happens with archives. Archives are. Some cases, many cases, dumped out. They have no idea what's in them. They're just dumped. And it's later, someone else goes along and finds, hey, look, wow, this is amazing. Hey, we've got all this stuff on Illuminati and, and Masons over here, and you have a whole crowd of people rushing in. As soon as you have that crowd of people rushing in, that's it, it's gone. Because they don't care, the, the, the people who are involved in this in terms of keeping things secret, because there are people who are design, who are on the payroll to keep things secret, They'll go in and they'll say, oh, oh, look, a lot of people here, they're seeing things they shouldn't be seeing. It doesn't matter what it is that they're seeing. Oh, we just shouldn't be seeing it. And they shut the entire archive down. They shut, they, they, what they'll do is they'll issue, they'll issue a, we'll call it a DCMA complaint. It's a Digital Millennium Copyright Act. The Digital, Digital Millennium Copyright Act has nothing to do with paying reparations to the artist. Because if, it were, if, if DCMA, the... the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was about getting paid, pay, paying, doing the reparations for intellectual property. The uh, black community, the ADOS community, would have the reparations right there. They would have had the reparations already. Because, you know, because a lot, most American music and most of the Western music today is based off of music that came out of slavery. It came out of the ADOS. Go look at the history, do the history of American music. You'll see ADOS. As the at the core of music, so if it were always about reparations, DCMA was about reparations, not censorship. Then the, then ADOS would have been paid already. As a matter of fact, 
they, it wouldn't have even be an issue because they would have been paid already, and there would be a bank, there would be a trust fund that they could dip into and take out as much as they want because there's always stuff coming in. There's always any time an artist produces something, uh, it, you know, a chunk of that money goes into you know a, a royalty goes into that bank account, into that piggy bank, if you will, and that's your ADOS piggy bank and. As long as there's something in there, you can sort of whatever project you want to work on, whoever people want to help out in terms of housing or whatever, you've got it right there. But this tells you what's going on. The DCMA was never about protecting intellectual property. It's about thought control. It's about hiding information and making, making sure that the narrative that they're telling is the only thing you hear. And this is this is this is true for uh, Howard University. Howard University gets its grants, its money from people who are interested in keeping a particular narrative. And the narrative they're trying to keep is the American, is the the a, the, a, the ADOS vassal. The ADOS vassal is the person who is there, elevated to a higher level of understanding. A, 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 a level of celebrity that they worship. They become an idol. They become your next idol. These are the people you pray to because, oh, look, there's our black god. There's our black this. There's our black, you know, our black prince or, 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 or whatever. This is what you see in, uh, you know, the, the, the VMAs and all this stuff. You ha have this sort of Enos royalty, if you will. But these Enos royalty is like, well, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. I gave I gave Fleet to Rashad the nickname, nickname the early name, the ghetto name of Fifi Richard, because Felisa Richard is a very high name. It's a, it's, it's a high-level name. It's there for the vassal. The ghetto, the ones who aren't in, in, in the vassal state, they're not elevated to that. They're on the lower level. They'll, they'll take uh, Felicia and call her Fifi and instead of being Richard, which is a French pronunciation, they'll call her Richards. In other words, a lot of the fanciness is gone. But what but happens? She is the vassal. And it's her job to keep and protect the other vassals. Why? Because they're protecting themselves. They're protecting their own self-interest. And what happens is the people who who are on the left-hand side, who believe in chaos, what do they want to do? What is the left-hand path about? It's about being selfish. So they are they will come out, come out the left-hand path and and most people won't even, won't even know this. This is saying, you know, Voltaire didn't know what was going on, but Hegel did. Hegel understood what was happening. As, so you need to connect to a Wi-Fi network or it's yeah. too hard first. That's my uh, that's my uh, Google thingy. This Google Assistant comes on on the weirdest times. Voltaire was given the right to do what he did because there were people who came up and said, don't worry, we'll pay for your publication. Because Voltaire was a playwright. He hid all his information in plays. This is what, this is what uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Shakespeare did. Uh, you have that a lot within a large chunk of the work. Uh, uh, H.G. Wells, uh, Dostoevsky, uh, a large chunk of the early writers always wrote history they did it in such a way that, that it was fictionalized that people really didn't know that it was again. It was <laughs> it was done in plain sight under a code. That's the, the way to sort of describe it. But the code wasn't wasn't anything anything significant, other than they simply changed the names of the people and the events, and so they created something that looked like fiction, but really wasn't fictional. You had an a good element of truth in there. And the thing is, this is this is what ha this is what ha Howard University is. This Howard University is this institution. Same thing with most most not just Howard University. Most universities are set up to create a work, to create a view of a position that traps a person in a particular mindset, a particular point of view. In other words, they're they're trapped within a narrative. Being anti-establishment, being open, being aware. Uh, in terms of being really being woke or re really being red pill means breaking all of the barriers. You have to step out the uh, outside the system completely. That's anti-establishment. What you're seeing uh, with BLM and, and Antifa, that's not that's not uh, and that's not anti-establishment. That's actually 
how the establishment uses them to create the control. BLM and Antifa are part of the establishment. They're tools of the establishment. They're not open. They're not free. But the way they are being used by the establishment <clears throat> to create a particular narrative. And it keeps the ADOS people trapped within the system. So BLM and Antifa are your trap. They're your oppressors. What happens with, 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 when this, when, when this is, occurs? Well, you have a thing called insurance. Most insurance companies uh, work the way they work because landlords will not rent you or lease you any particular property unless, of course, you have insurance. So you have a neighborhood that's been burnt down by BLM. Guess what happens to the black businesses when they try to reopen again? Because they burn everything down, including the black businesses. Well, oh, you're black. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're in this neighborhood. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, we can't insure you. So without the insurance, they can't open their business. Because they can't, without, without the insurance, you can't get your lease. Your business is gone. Next point. Oh, you can always go online. Sell things through the internet. Okay. If you're in that particular neighborhood, let's say inner city Baltimore, inner city Chicago, inner city Atlanta, what courier company is going to come into your building and pick your pick your packages up that you want to sell? How far do you have to go before you get to a, <clears throat> a shipping depot? Do you have a car? Because you're not supposed to have a car anymore because... Everyone has to do. Everyone who's on a lower level has to be mass transit. Uh, are you vaxxed? Are you double vaxxed? Triple vaxxed? Quadruple vaxxed? Do you have a mask on? Look at the restrictions that are being done in terms of, of movement now. When you travel, you're put in prison. What? Oh, it's not prison. We're going to a hotel. No, that hotel is a prison. You can't leave. They recently on 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 on. on on a flight coming into, uh, I think it was uh, Amsterdam, uh, they, someone was taken off a plane and quarantined. No particular reason why. There was no in, in, no visible sign of, uh, of infection or anything like that. They just took them off a plane and put, imprisoned them. They put, they put them in, a, oh, we're taking you to a hotel. But they weren't allowed to do anything. They weren't allowed to leave the room. They uh, had to get rain, uh, room service. They couldn't go out to the... No, it was, it was a prison. They were brought food and so when they left on their own, they just simply walked out, got on a plane to go places. The plane was stopped in the tarmac, and it, it, it was raided by the by uh, by the army. They were taken out at gunpoint with all the weapons pointed at these unarmed people being taken off the plane. No one said anything. You understand that that and this is where you would see evil coming in. This chaos benefits evil. And unfortunately, the liberal left who talk about progressive, being progressive, well, the progressive, what is the mechanism of progressive? It is progress out of chaos. It is the emergence from chaos. It is Gnostic in its origin. So the people at the top are simply creating the socialism. They're creating the leftism. They're creating even the, 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 um, even the so-called right, the alt-right or this right, or whatever right you want to talk about, they're created, they're, they're a work, but the people who are involved in this stuff don't see it as a work. They see they're doing something real. Well, I'm a leftist, I'm a Marxist, I'm a this, I'm a that. No, you're not. You're created. And you're controlled. You're part of the narrative. Those are Antifa and BLM are part of the narrative. And this goes back to Edward Bernays, to, to Sigmund Freud. So, oh, yeah, you know, Sigmund Freud, he was out to destroy the church. No, he wasn't. He, at this at some point in time, stopped believing. And he was part of the uh, of the Voltaire movement that didn't see a God there. They said, oh, you're in the period of what time we call the modernists. That was after the 1800s, where they said, we know everything. So he lived, he lived, he, and, and that lasted until basically 1945 with the explosion of the atomic bomb. Up until 1945, 
They were convinced that mathematics and science would tell them everything, that this was the truth and that there was no God. So this is how you, call, this is how you get social engineering. Social engineering comes out of it because the Catholics were doing this, doing this the Protestants were doing, doing this, but they all failed. The Catholics failed, the Protestants failed. And so now came in your social engineers, your humanists, and they said, oh, we're going to succeed, but they failed. 1945, the initial failure pops up. Oh, we know everything. We, and they had determined that the, the atomic bomb wasn't possible. 1945, the dropping of, Hiroshima, of, of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki destroyed all their scientific theories. Because here was, in front of your eyes, a reality that did not, meet up, did not meet up with math and science. And that was the end. On came so this new thing called postmodernism, where postmodernism was that the entire world is a concept. It's an illusion. It's not real. And this is where you have the key point here. Again, this is something Gnostic because most people don't understand this. Most people blame the 60s, uh, the, the, the LSD experiments on Timothy Leary. They always forget his partner. His partner was a... Uh, a, a, of Jewish descent, I'll say this, uh, who had become disaffected with the life he was living in terms of wealth and went out to search something, for something more. He became a, prof a very qualified professor of psychology, uh, but then got involved with Timothy Leary as they began working together on psilocybin and LSD. Well, this affected uh, you know, this guy so much. He was the son of a railroad Railroad magnet. Uh, if you know uh, Burlington North, Northern North, Burlington Northern, uh, Burlington, blah, Bur Burlington Suffolk uh, Northern, as a BS, BS, uh, and F something like that. Uh, well, that that's his. Fa that was his father's railroad. This is a guy who, who whose father owned a large chunk of America's rail system, and. He ended up going to uh, it, uh, to India. Uh, this was afterwards a professor, and hooked up with the, all the gurus that the uh, American hippies were hooking up with. And he came back as Ram Das. Well, so, well, what's this person Ram Das about? Why, why is he important? Because he brought in the Gnostic aspect of of the uh, of the illusion world of the sort of the the, the hidden state world. That was something, nothing more than a concept. And the the, the guru he met was left hand path. And the, the gurus on the left hand path look right; they look like they're teaching spirituality, spirituality, but they're actually teaching evil. It's about creating chaos. Well, who came out of who came out of Ram Das? Well, this is a guy named Doctor Wheel. You go look at Doctor Wheel. This he's a doctor, a medical doctor, uh, who includes a large chunk of this herbology in there. You know the the mind body healing thing. And this is where you get all this sort of the crystals. The you get all these different gurus. Which we're now talking about uh, yoga and so on and so forth, healing your chakras. This is where all this comes from. And he set up institutes to do this. And who else came out of there? Oprah. So once you have now we have this connection between Ram Dass and Oprah. You begin this, and you go from Oprah, you go to, to to Obama. You begin to understand where this is coming from. That is not our world is not isolated, not separated from 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 Nazis, from 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 the Gnostics, and most of the Gnostics at the higher up. This is what we're talking about Faust, the Faust issue. Are not right hand path. They're left hand path. They're there to for, for to create progress out of chaos. This is what they believe. So you will never get something out of the leftists who call themselves progressive because they're there to destroy. Anyways, uh, I think this is going to be it for now. And I will see you uh, in for tomorrow night. We'll, we'll sort of continue along this line, try to get a little more depth into this. But uh, again, these are complex subjects uh, and the depths uh, are a little difficult to sort of Evolve. We are Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Queen in Middle School for Life. Those are